This is Karen Shiyazaki. Welcome to our Digital Risk Podcast. I'm a member of the SIM Dallas Fort Worth Fellows and a co founder of SIM National's Digital Risk SIG. I'm also the CIO of a Santa Fe based mortgage company, and I'm a senior fellow with the Divine Center of Excellence for Digital Security and Risk. Today, I am continuing the conversation with Peter Vogel. Peter is a fellow SIM DFW member and an attorney with Foley and Lardner. He's a member of Foley's Privacy, Security, and Information Management and Technology Transactions and Outsourcing Practices. So Peter, welcome back. Thank you. In our last two podcasts, we discussed contractual considerations when you're vetting cloud service providers. And now that you've inked a deal, things are going well, but that does not mean your due diligence efforts can be shelved. Peter, uh, what should we be doing to stay on top of our vendor engagements? Thanks, Karen. I, thanks for asking that question. Right this minute, as I'm sitting here today, I'm in the midst of negotiating a workday um, ERP uh, contract. And so there's some contractual issues that I cook into these agreements to try and help my clients, like for instance, in this warranty, you can see I added a specific provision that says if Workday decides they're going to change any of the online exhibits, that we have the right to terminate the contract. If you don't have a provision, they had something like that, and they change some term online without giving you any warning, and it adversely impacts your business, then you're stuck with it. And you, it may not be exactly what people want, I think. On the other hand, uh, if for whatever reason, your cloud provider goes into bankruptcy or you go into bankruptcy, you don't want the contract automatically terminate at that moment because your business could go could suffer or go you could go out of business or the, the, there's no income stream to the cloud provider. So what I did was I add this and virtually everybody agrees to it. They don't have a problem that we're going to let the bankruptcy court look at this for 60 days. And Karen, I know you've got experience with bankruptcy. So you understand, and I'm not sure how many SIM members appreciate it, that a bankruptcy judge or a trustee will take over because they want to make sure the creditors receive a fair amount of money. That's all they care about. But the you, your business fail because you're in bankruptcy or because the cloud provider is in bankruptcy. Also, it's very important at the end of the, the relationship that you have the ability to retrieve your data and that not all contracts are as specific as this. This one's not bad in Workday. You can see they have it based on their standard web services, only they haven't given us their standard web services. So as a matter of fact, that's why it's highlighted in pink because I've asked Workday, so what are these standards? And so reference to it without telling us makes a difference. Oftentimes, these are on links and you just get a URL. Also, the transition period. Now, this is critical, I think, if you're going to at the end, but you also, you decide or your business decides to change cloud providers, how much time do you need to go to a new service? If it's a, assuming it's, we're talking about a software as a service, you can't just change from ERP overnight, 30 days, it maybe may take a year. So that transition period is really critical. Now, another possibility is, let's say somebody comes to buy you. Your company is acquired by some e enormous international corporation and you want to, to uh, move on with, the, with this business opportunity. And Amazon says, no, we won't consent to that. See, they have the right to withhold the ability for you to assign the contract, or maybe they'll charge you more money. They this in such a way where it makes it very unpleasant for you the assignment. Who decides if something is unreasonably withheld? A jury in court. Not something that you control. Amazon decides that they don't want to, you're kind of stuck with that. Now, if we go look at the AWS uh, terms of service, and we looked at in the earlier podcast about the free tier, but they also have ones where they charge. Just let's look at their standard agreement. In termination, uh, they have the right to suspend the service, uh, among other things, in, in A down there, if their relationship with the third party the provider changes. Or the one that I think is really critical at the very end in C, and that is in order to comply with the law or request of a government entity. So let's say Department of Justice says 
we want you to stop providing services to everybody. Amazon will discontinue that service at that time. And then th this is also with the assignment uh, that we can't transfer it without their prior written consent. See, this is the same thing that Workday does, that they have the ability to control it. And of course, the very end sentence on assignment is you want the successor Assuming you assign it because you're acquired by some big international company, you want them to have the right to continue operating under this agreement. Also, one of the other great complications I think that we all have in looking at cloud services is how many different solutions are there? How many different packages are available? Software as a service is a huge issue in today's world. And I think part of the complication is if you pick, let's say, um, SAP as a service on AWS and for whatever reason you fall out of love with SAP, does that mean you could easily switch over to Oracle? I think we all know it's not that simple. And so the software is a service that you select, you may be them for years and years. So you have to give a lot of thought to selecting the software as a service from, uh, from Amazon when they offer that. Well, Karen, do you have any other questions about the topics that I raised today in this podcast? Um, yeah, I was thinking, um, you know, I, I've, I've, I'm happy with my cloud service provider, things are going well, but, um, you know, as you've mentioned, the terms of service really drive a lot of the things that one should be concerned about. Do you have any advice for how uh, people should be staying on top of things? Um, how do you track when terms of service change? Let's say I hadn't put a provision in my original contract about being deliberately notified, but they can change it. And I, how do I stay on top of that? Well, it, 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 question, and I hate to say it, there isn't a simple answer. And I, just by way of example for what we just saw, Workday is providing the ERP system for my client, or they will when we sign the contract. Well, they have a contract with AWS, but they have no duty if you look at the SOC 2 type 2 report, they have no duty to share that information with us. So if Amazon sign, AWS makes a change to terms of service, they may well tell Workday, but how do we know that Workday would tell us? It's, it, there's, you know, there's a break there. So the, the whole problem, I think, is that most of the cloud providers, the big ones that we are all concerned about, Amazon, Microsoft, they sell the service to somebody else, and then that, that company sells it to another company. So there's a break in between. So what I recommend, this is just an approach to it, is that I periodically go look to see the dates on when things change. And it's not a bad idea. So I already pointed that out earlier on AWS, that their terms, they just changed uh, November 30th, 2020. Well, as I think I may have mentioned in one of the earlier podcasts, when they went, when they changed uh, their service, uh, terms of service for Chrome, they hadn't changed it in 10 years. So it's sort of like, what is going on? And I, I think I told you that has to be over 7,000 internet years. So I guess my point is, I think if there's a duty of somebody and it could, should be someone in terms of uh, cloud responsibility to periodically check. And I don't mean every week or every year, but I but there, you ought to have a program time where you go look to see if there have been any updates. The complicating issue gets to be how many different services are you actually getting? I think I made that other example on service level agreements. I have a client that's in the HVAC uh, management business and they use 15 different uh, SLAs from Amazon. So they could change one of them and not change the other 14. And it's really hard to keep up with all that. So that's a great question. But I do think that 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 IT professionals should cook that into their routine where the, every so often they put it on their calendar and they go, there have been any updates. That's probably the safe way to do it. Oh, okay. No, th thanks for that advice. And, and then um, an another thought I had was, so let's say my business model radically shifts since I had signed the original contract with my cloud service provider. Uh, you know, and it could be something like, let's say I was only operating in the United States and all of a sudden I'm gonna be operating in Singapore or all of a sudden I'm gonna be having a business presence somewhere in the EU. Uh, how do I uh, get my cloud service provider to shift with me 
uh, would you recommend that, that this is something I should have been, uh, you know, had a lot of foresight on and baked into the contract up front or? Oh, no. I, you know, actually, there's a simple answer to that. I, it, it's a great problem because you're growing, you're migrating, you need to have your data in another country or another part of the world. They'll just charge you a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of, go, you go to them and say, okay, now we have to have the data in Singapore. So they go, oh, well, good. It'll cost you three X every month to what you're already doing. Cause I think that's the simple answer. The legal issue behind that is theoretically, you have to get them to contractually agree to it. But my thought is if your business is dependent on that cloud, then they have so much leverage over you. What can you do about it? You have no, you have no bargaining position. So it's a, it's just going to cost you more money. That's kind of what it boils down to. Yeah. And, and not to mention, I mean, in those particular instances where now you've got a slew of data privacy concerns that you've got to deal with, which has an extra layer of complexity when you're dealing with your cloud service providers. Well, yeah, yeah that's right. And I think that's true. But I'll tell you something that everybody can do. Uh, and I have talked about this before, is when you're doing that and you're migrating to another country, it's probably a good, good idea to look at the ISO 27001 report, the stock two type two reports, because they explain how they manage those privacy uh, obligations in different countries. So I would encourage, encourage everybody to do that. I think that's a simple way to kind of take care of what are the privacy laws, but Generally, most of the large cloud providers, they are in compliance with GDPR. So yeah. that's not a problem. I think the bigger problem is that if um, a new state law comes up, which we're having in a number of states right now, and they're in conflict with one another, ha has the cloud provider contemplated that? And that gets to be kind of a tricky question. But, but I think it's so important for them that they will make sure that they try and stay in compliance. Okay. Well, uh, that's been our discussion today with Peter, and we are going to be returning in the next uh, podcast to discuss what happens when things go not so well with your cloud service provider and the things that can happen and the things you should be thinking about. So again, uh, thank you, Peter, for joining us today. And I'm Karen Shiyazaki. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Karen. If you have any questions, please email them to digiriskzig at simnet.org. We'll be happy to get the answers and they will be posted on the DigiRiskSig website. And again, this podcast was produced in collaboration between the Dallas-Fort Worth Sim Fellows Group and the Sim DigiRiskSig. Thank you.